Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this uh, IEC uh, symposium. Uh, I'm Robert Bissonnette. I'm the current IEC president. We'll get started. I know many people are coming in today, so the room will fill up uh, as, we, uh, as we start. But uh, we need to start if we want to be on time. Um, I, I, I remember the first time I was in this beautiful room a number of years ago, and I hope that it's not your first time because I remember my first time, I had a very hard time concentrating on the presentations because the room was so beautiful and the ceiling and the painting. So if you've been here a few times, you'll be able to uh, concentrate and focus on the interesting presentations and different presentations we have. All right, so I'll, I'll say a few words about um, IEC. Um, the, you, you all received this QR code. If you're interested in uh, getting the electronic version of the agenda today, you can scan it. Good. So uh, any questions about IEC, you can get in touch with myself or our uh, CEO, Alan Stiles. You can see the email here. All right, so IEC started in 2014, so very soon. It will be our 10th anniversary. The organization is a nonprofit organization devoted to a topic dermatitis, teaching, research, uh, and uh, education on atopic dermatitis. It was created by uh, Amy Poller and Emma Gutman. This is the uh, current uh, summary of our representation. We have a fairly global representation with uh, counselors and associates from uh, all regions of the world. We now have 93 counselors and 33 associates. And these are the countries where we currently have associates and counselors. So <clears throat> if, you, if you are a dermatologist or an allergist and are active in another country, and uh, if you are very involved in atopic dermatitis, either uh, by teaching, by doing research, or publishing, and you're interested to join IEC, have a look at our website. We're welcoming new members. So as I mentioned before, our mission is focused on atopic dermatitis, specifically on the, uh, education and facilitating research in atopic dermatitis. This is a list of our current corporate sponsors. So if you work for one of those companies, thank you very much for supporting IEC. Without you, symposium like the one we're having today would not be possible. So this is a summary of our activities this year. We've been very active. We were at uh, the Quad AI Allergy Meeting for the first time in San Antonio. We were at AAD and EADV as usual, uh, ISID in Tokyo, RADLA in uh, Latin America. Uh, we had the uh, in-person symposium there, and World Congress of Dermatology in Singapore this summer. So we uh, offer fellowships in order to be able to train the future generations of uh, dermatologists and allergists who will devote and focus their time on atopic dermatitis. So we have a, uh, we announced recently uh, the uh, person who won the Canadian Fellowship Award. So this person uh, is Dr. Uh, Mary Leno uh, from the Philippines who will work with our counselor Aaron Drucker at the University of Toronto. We have a U.S. clinical fellowship uh, that is now open. This is a one-month clinical fellowship that is open uh, to work in the U.S. So if you want to know more about this, you can have a look at our website. And uh, fairly soon, uh, you will have the opportunity to uh, apply for an international fellowship or let your residents or uh, young faculty know that there will be an international fellowship available. Uh, one year, uh, mostly research fellowship, in-person fellowship. But we also have a, a travel bursary program. So those of you either working in countries where funds are not as available for traveling to go to larger meetings, or if you're in touch with people uh, who are um, focused on atopic dermatitis and live in those countries, uh, please uh, look at our website. So we do provide funding to come to larger meetings, specifically if people are presenting in atopic dermatitis, but also if people have a strong interest and would like to attend an IEC symposium and a regular meeting. 
Uh, finally, uh, manuscripts and special projects, we're always open. So if you're an IEC counselor or an associate, then you have an idea. It could be something simple, could be something complex, uh, could involve research, could involve systematic literature review, could involve anything, in fact. Uh, let us know. So if we, if we require funding, we can help you. Um, sometimes some of the projects do not require funding or can be funded by our internal funds. And we have a uh, specific process uh, to evaluate all ideas, uh, either through uh, research or publication ideas. Very good, and this I already talked about. All right, now uh, I'll introduce our uh, two co-chairs today. Uh, if you have any interest in the topic dermatitis, if you are working in this area uh, in terms of research and you've attended presentations on the topic dermatitis, you know them both. Uh, they're, they're fairly well known in the topic dermatitis world. They're two of the most well-known people involved in the topic dermatitis research. Uh, so we have the uh, honor today of having Emma Gutman and Kenji Kabashima as co-chairs for the symposium. So Dr. Kabashima is an IC counselor. He's currently the secretary of the board of directors, has been involved with IC since the start. Uh, he's currently a professor and chair of dermatology at the University of Kyoto, and he also uh, is uh, directing a, a large laboratory in Singapore. Uh, he's a principal investigator at the ASTAR Research Skin Lab, the Singapore Immunology Network. Dr. Emma Gutman is uh, one of the two founders of IC. She is currently the system chair of the dermat the dermatology department at the Wallman Professor of Dermatology Immunology at Aiken School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, New York, and she's the director of the Center for Excellence in Eczema and uh, Laboratory for Inf Inflammatory Skin Diseases. I could go on and on and on about the two speakers, but that's not what you're interested in. You're probably interested in looking, seeing, and hearing the interesting talks we'll have today. So uh, we'll give the floor to Emma. Thank you so much for this really kind introduction. Um, I think there is some noise here. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to co-chair the symposium with Kenji that I consider him a friend and a collaborator for a very long time. Uh, and I'm really excited to introduce <coughs> the first speaker, uh, Patrick Brunner, uh, that is actually from our department. So um, Patrick, I'm sure, is known to all of you. He started this work in atopic dermatitis and is still uh, focusing on atopic dermatitis, but he also branched out to multiple other inflammatory skin diseases and uh, also uh, oncological diseases. And he directs at Mount Sinai a clinic dedicated to cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And he does one of the first uh, trial for patients with CTCL with mechanistic work. And I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about it. But today I'm super excited that uh, he'll talk to us about single cell and atopic dermatitis. So Patrick. Thank you so much. Um, it's good to be back in this uh, beautiful hall. And um, I'm excited to talk about single cell in atopic dermatitis. If you have my talk. Right, thank you so much. So these are my disclosures. So you're all aware of the fact that um, you can, atopic dermatitis is a human disease, so you need to study human material into, in order to, you know, eventually really know what's going on. And for many years or decades, the only way to analyze biopsies was really to, um, you don't have a pointer, no. Hmm? Ah, there it is. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, so, you know, so far we, uh, when analyzing human tissue, for a long time you had to extract DNA, RNA, or proteins, you would analyze and then you get one value for one sample, right? But now we have the ability to look at each of those cells individually due to the advent of single cell technology. So with single cell RNA sequencing, you need to take human tissue, the skin, you dissociate it, you digest it, you get single cells out of it, and now these single cells are encapsulated in certain blebs with enzymes and um, labeling tags, and with this you can then 
conduct uh, a bunch of complicated bioinformatics processes where they end up with a, with a visualization where each cell, where each dot represents one cell and you get a whole transcript home for each cell and you get about up to 10,000, 15,000 cells per sample. So this, uh, this is a landmark, landmark paper that Helen He did under the guidance of Emma Gutman, and it was the first paper to comprehensively assess atopic dermatitis, um, single cells in atopic dermatitis. And as you can see here, this is a typical plot where you can look at those cells. Each dot is one cell, and those cells are displayed in a way that cells that have a similar transcriptome cluster together. And then you can look at canonical markers, and then you can identify certain cells as T-cells, keratinocytes, vascular endothelial cells, and so on, depending on the key markers that they produce. This is, of course, a very complicated um, method, and this complicated methods, method is, of course, prone to bias, so you need to be very, very careful to do a good quality control. You want to eliminate cells that are sort of empty dying cells. You also want to eliminate doublets, and uh, so you want to have a good quality, you want to have good quality data. The other thing is this is an enormous amount of data. So our brain can, of course, not look at all those numbers. Our brain needs to see it in a two-dimensional space. So what we've been knowing for a long time are just principal component analysis, where you, where you take two components and display an information on multiple data points in one plot. But this is not sufficient for single cell RNA sequencing. So there are two plots, so-called TISNE plots and Yuma plots, that are now usually being used. They have some advantages one over the other, but the most commonly used is the Yuma plot, where, as I said, again here one dot is one cell, but here cells that are similar cluster together and that are more a, a different cluster separate. And it's not trivial to bring sort of this um, big data into the two in a two-dimensional space. So this is uh, the paper that um, Helen did with, uh, with Emma, and they identified new uh, cells, they showed uh, the co-expression of type 2 and type 22 cytokines, and you do not only get single cells out of it, you get all the information, you get ligands, you get receptors, you get cytokine production, and then from this you can infer how those cells might crosstalk. This is, of course, these are bioinformatics analysis, it's not a functional proof, but nevertheless you can get lots of information and then you can uh, carry this forward to functional experiments, and you can then uh, see uh, sort of cells that produce periostin, how this inter, uh, sort of uh, reprosicates re with uh, receptor uh, ligand interactions. Um, there were new fibroblast population being um, investigated, so fibroblasts are now coming very much in the focus of uh, skin, biology, skin immunobiology research because fibroblasts were somehow neglected in the past and you couldn't really analyze them very well. But now with single cell technology, it's much easier to also investigate those cells and now new, um, uh, new uh, populations are um, are, are being investigated and detected. So one important thing about, of course, investigations in human disease is the gold standard really is a skin punch biopsy. But skin punch biopsies are not always, um, you know, they, they have the advantage you get all layers of the skin. But of course it leads to some substance defect, you have to suture them, and you might get um, super infections, and of course you get scarring from this process. So one method that is now um, being, um, um, being um, um, used by a Magatmas group are tape strips, which are of course um, a, um, a, a method that you can also use in clinical routine, in clinical studies. Um, we were think, but with, with tape strips, you get very good information on expressing data, but cells you do not get out from them. So we were thinking about another less invasive method to get cells out of the skin, and we used suction blistering. So suction blistering works that you put a a, a negative pressure chamber on your skin. So this chamber is airtight, has a, uh, has a um, metal plate on the bottom and has holes in this um, plate. And there's a negative pressure device um, attached to this uh, chamber. And over the course of one to two hours, you get formation of these blisters. So these are blisters where you get a split on the basement membrane. So the whole thing heals without scarring. And the blister roof is the epidermis and the blister contact 
content, the blister fluid is intercellular um, um, fluid, uh, like tissue fluid with all the tissue mediators, as well as um, skin cells that are actively migrating, they're like T cells and dendritic cells. And here you can so just cut off the, uh, the blister roof, and then you can digest it with trypsin, for example, and get keratinocytes, lung cells, and all other epidermal cells that have been there. And then you can also, of course, harvest the blister fluid. So we were interested in seeing or in investigating what cells are we actually getting with this method. How complete is it compared to the gold standard, which are skin punch biopsies. Then we fuck sorted those cells and performed single cell RNA sequencing. Because one advantage of single cell RNA sequencing is also that you usually need only very small amounts of T off of cells. Uh, in order to get thousands of cells out. So here on the left, you get cells that we got out with conventional skin biopsies, and on the right, what we got out with, uh, with skin suction blistering. And you see that it is very comparable, like keratinocyte populations are very similar. Also, T cell populations are very similar. And um, Heidi Elbe-Bürger, for example, she has showed in a different study that T cells and dendritic cells actively migrate into those blisters. So you do not only get sort of passive transfer, some especially mobile skin cells actively migrate into that blister fluid and this is why you get the broader spectrum that you would expect. If you want to look at endothelial cells with muscle cells and fibroblasts, you're not going to get them with suction blistering, of course. But you also get quite a bunch of dendritic cells this method is not great for macrophages. Macrophages are very sessile population. They don't move a lot. For example, they take up uh, pigment from uh, tattoos, and this is why tattoos are permanent. So the more permanent cells, you're not going to get that well, but migratory cells and epidermal cells are usually there. One advantage of, um, of uh, suction blistering is also that it's less stressful for the cells. And how do you see that some cell stress is happening, some cell death is happening? There's a phenomenon called ambient RNA contamination. Because if you're in the process of, for example, digesting a skin biopsy, if you digest it a lot, then you might get dying cells, and then those cells will release mRNA, and if it's high abundant RNA, this will contaminate your whole um, um, uh, uh, sample, and then you get low-level expression of genes that shouldn't be um, there in certain cells. So, for example, S100A markers, or for example, keratin 6A, which is a keratin which should only be present in keratinocytes, right? You see keratinocytes show higher expression here as evidenced by the red color, but you get this low level expression, this light red hue also in other cells such as dendritic cells or T cells. And, um, and this is of course an artifact. Uh, when you look at uh, suction blistering um, samples, um, this uh, difference is much cleaner. You only really get keratin in keratinocytes and the T cells and dendritic cells are clean. To be said, I mean, this sort of um, contamination, there are bioinformatic processes to get rid of it, but still it's sort of a post, of post hoc manipulation. So with this, you get sort of cleaner cells. The good thing about single cell um, RNA sequencing is, as I said, you also can look at very small amounts of skin. And we were interested in the question, what actually happens in patients that are being treated, are being successfully treated, for example, with dupilumab for one year, what happens in their skin? Because one thing with, uh, with uh, targeted treatments is they are an excellent treatment option, but usually when you stop it, sooner or later the disease comes back in most patients. It doesn't really lead to a rebound, as we've seen with older the antipsoriatic uh, drugs, but slowly the disease comes back, so there must be some sort of skin disease memory that persists and survives even targeted treatments. For the future, we hope to have these more disease-modifying treatments, but we are not there yet. So we investigated dupilumab-treated atopic dermatitis patients at baseline 16 weeks and one year of treatment. And when you look at dupilumab-treated patients after one year, the histological picture totally normalizes. Cell numbers totally normalize. And visually, on a histological level, after one year of dupilumab-treatment, the skin looks totally normal. Um, uh, 
in, uh, on with this. But then we looked, we performed single cell RNA sequencing and assessed what cells might still be there after one year of topilumab treatment. And um, when you compare to healthy controls, there was one population that was still there even after one year of topilumab treatment, and these are CRTH2 positive he um, helper T cells. These are type 2 uh, T cells that produce IL-13, and they were very resistant tissue-resident memory cells that survived even one year of topilumab treatment, and we also found it in immunohistochemistry, sitting very scattered, not so many, but still they are there, and, um, and, uh, and these cells are absent in healthy controls. And it is conceivable that those cells are tissue-resident memory cells that constitute the disease memory, um, because those cells have an interesting feature. They harbor so-called alamine receptors, so alamines are mediators that are being produced by the epidermis, and they are readily produced, for example, when you scratch the epidermis, they are, they are produced and then they can work on these cells and the concept might be that those cells are silenced as long as you give the treatment, but when you stop the treatment over some certain amount of time, those um, alamines can then work on those cells again and they might mediate then the relapse. How do we know? Of course, this is only circumstantial evidence, nothing, nothing of it is um, sort of functional, but when you... Um, when you look at other uh, groups that looked at those cells, there's one group that investigated those cells in peanut allergic patients in the blood. And the interesting thing was that these TH2A cells disappeared uh, after peanut-specific immunotherapy. So this is circumstantial evidence that these cells might be relevant for allergy mediation. And one could think that those cells are sitting in the skin and might mediate ambient allergy exposure, for example, if they have the appropriate T-cell receptor. Another thing is now with single cell RNA sequencing, once you have a standardized protocol, you can compare to other itchy skin diseases such as chronic nodular prurigo, for example, because both atopic dermatitis and chronic nodular prurigo are, of course, very itchy. They can happen together, but at the end of the day, I mean, those lesions, of course, look very different. You can then integrate all the single cell data into a sort of pseudobulk analysis and look at, um, at the pathway analysis. I'm not sure you're going to be able to read it, but what you can see here in atopic dermatitis, there are tons of immune pathways active in AD, much more than chronic nodular prurigo, actually. So in chronic nodular prurigo, there's extracellular matrix receptor interaction, there's collagen biosynthesis, there's, um, there's um, integrin, there, there are certain pathways, smooth muscle cell contraction that are more associated with wound healing and fibrosis, uh, whereas the top markers are really in atopic dermatitis, are immune genes. Uh, with single cell RNA sequencing, we can, you know, as long as the gene is detected, so it's not a perfectly sensitive uh, method. If you do a quantitative PCR for certain molecules, it's much more sensitive, but less it gives you this complexity. And then you can look, for example, in this T-cell cluster, you can look at healthy controls, you can look at atopic dermatitis, and you look at chronic nodular prurigo, and you look, can look at all of our favorite uh, mediators, right, that we want to look at. For example, interleukin-13, vastly upregulated in atopic dermatitis, much more than in healthy controls. And there's some expression in chronic nodular prurigo, not as high as in AD, but still it is there. When we look at absolute cell counts, we see that independent of what cluster we are looking, CD4, CD8, uh, cells proliferating cells. So in atopic dermatitis, T cell numbers are much higher than in chronic nodular prurigo. They're not zero, but T cell numbers are much higher in atopic dermatitis than chronic nodular prurigo. One very um, important thing that we can also do with single cell RNA sequencing, we cannot only look at sort of the cytokine production pattern, receptor production pattern, we can also sequence the T cell receptor. And then we can sort of give uh, each T cell an identity and we can look, is it a polyclonal environment, is it an oligoclonal environment, or is it a monoclonal environment like in lymphomas? And then we can, of course, follow those cells over time. And what we did, we just... Um, quantified the top expanded clones in atopic dermatitis compared to healthy controls and chronic nodular prurigo. Um, and found that in chronic nodular prurigo and healthy control, the top 10 clone numbers, absolute numbers, are sort of within the same order of magnitude. And it was a little higher in atopic dermatitis. I mean, it was not increased like a monoclonal disease like lymphoma or so, but still in all the 
population, all the patients we looked, there was a sort of very consistent increase in top expanded clones in atopic dermatitis, sort of an oligoclonal pattern. Why do we think that this is not just an artifact or, um, or an irrelevant bystander? Because when you, when you look at these top 10 expanded clones, you can map them on the T-cell cluster, right? So here this T-cell cluster shows you CD4 cells more to the left, CD8 cells more at the right, so you can really map out several T-cell populations. And when you look at um, healthy controls or chronic nodular prurigo, they are sort of scattered all over, but in atopic dermatitis they are really ex not, only a little, not only expanded, but they are really clustering here in the center. So the distribution seems to here seems uh, not stochastic or not um, by chance as opposed to healthy control and chronic nodular prurigo. We can also display it here, for example. So these are the T-cell clusters, 1, 2, 7, and proliferating cells like mapped out here. And when we allocate those top expanded clones to individual clusters, you see that this is really a random distribution, right? Because here are the larger clusters, and on the left are the larger clusters, on the right are the smaller clusters, and this is just absolute random distribution also here. But here in atopic dermatitis, we get this very consistent an increase in a certain T5 cluster, and this is why we think this might be something specific, and one could speculate that these are T cells that, for example, react to environmental allergens and mediate a disease flare upon allergen exposure, for example. We can also look at the cytokine expression pattern of those cells, and we see that in atopic dermatitis, those top 10 cells, so the, the size of the circle shows you the percentage of the cells that produce it and the color, the strength, and you see that those top expanded clones in atopic dermatitis are strong IL-13 producers. They all produce IL-22, 26, and others, but they are, they are one of the top IL-13 producers, so this points to the fact that those cells might be a key cells in atopic dermatitis development. So in order to sum up, single-cell RNA sequencing now, of course, offers a new insight into atopic dermatitis lesion at unprecedented depth. The great thing for human investigations, you only need very little amount of samples if you have a good isolation protocol. I think the combination with the T-cell receptor is very powerful, and we might be able to maybe trace clones over time. It's, of course, not a monoclonal disease, but certain T-cells. So the question is, is the T-cell receptor relevant for atopic dermatitis, which we don't really know, because it's, I mean, it's not, not a bona fide autoimmune disease, but I think we will see. And um, as I said, very small amounts are sufficient to um, obtain transcriptomes of thousands of individual cells. With this slide, I want to conclude. I want to thank all uh, my group members. I want to thank all my collaborators and the funders. And again, thanks so much uh, for having me here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so. This uh, doesn't no, work. No, no, it's ah. uh, thank you so much for this really wonderful talk, and we'll open now for any questions from the audience. Yeah. Thank you for the great overview. Um, how is the aesthetic outcome after the suction blisters? I've seen some people who have this uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Yes, yes, you get. Yes, you get dark spots. Spots you get post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but that resolves over a few months. Yes. Thank you. And there was one over there. Just okay. Thank you for the nice talk. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the fibroblasts that you mentioned? I assume that like they are not a great population in the suction blisters, but even you know in the punch biopsies, right? We optimize dissociation in a way that we really get the most out of our adaptive immune compartment. So how do we best approach the question what is the true role of these fibroblasts? with single cell. I'm, pre suggest? I'm pretty sure they play a very important um, role. I mean, he, um, in Helen's paper, for uh, this uh, discovered a certain population of called 6A5, 6A6, collating uh, positive fibroblasts that have been found before. And um, when you treat patients with dupilumab, this called 6A5, 6A6 goes down. So they seem to be under the control of interleukin 13. So I'm pretty sure when the question is whether they are sort of 
um, bystanders who are actively involved in uh, in disease pathogenesis. But I mean, those T cells are sitting have close contact with all those fibroblasts in the dermis, and I think we're just starting to learn. But I think. Now looking at fibroblasts, I think this is really a technology-driven discovery because now we have the tool in our hands to better um, look at those cells that have been overlooked in the past, for sure. Dan. Thank you. That was, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. I was particularly interested in the section when you talked about the resident memory cells in the dupilumab-treated patients, but you didn't really show us that they were, in fact, resident memory cells, other than the fact that they were there late. Have you had a chance to look at patients that then relapse later on, and particularly combine that with your TCR sequencing to show, indeed, that those are the clones that, that grow out again? So in that study, there was a three-prime kit, so that was not possible at that time to look at T-cell receptors because you have to come from the five-prime site in order to um, investigate a T-cell receptor, so we don't have that for those samples. But uh, we also looked at patients that had moderate to severe topic dermatitis as, child, as children, still had um, uh, sensitization to environmental allergens, young adults, and those patients don't harbor these cells. So either, so this uh, sort of raises the question, why do some patients go into long-term remission after atopic dermatitis as a child, and why do some people keep the disease? And it seems that uh, patients that go in long-term remission or even um, even um, lost the disease as young adults, they seem not to have those TH2A cells. But they express your markers of tissue resident memory like CD69, they're CCR7 negative, so they are usually expressing the markers that you would expect from tissue resident memory T cells, and they are sitting there for over a year, even due, due to treatment. So it doesn't seem that they recirculate. But I mean, now we have data that also tissue resin memory cells is not a one-way road. They can also recirculate, um, uh, as Dr. Graz, I think, uh, demonstrates. But, um, but the usual tissue resin memory markers are expressed by those cells. I'm going to sneak and ask you one more quick question. Um, you suggest alarmins as being a potential role for uh, one of the factors that keeps the resident memory cells. I don't, like in the case of like the TH17, it seems to be IL-23, that's the important cytokine. Do you have any thoughts about what it might be for a TH2 model? No, I, I, I don't think that they keep them alive. I think uh, they, these cells just have alamine receptors on their surface, and uh, one might speculate, but this is pure speculation, that those cells, once the pilumab is gone, they can quickly wake up because they have all the equipment to detect alamines from the epidermis. But we don't have any evidence whether alamines uh, keep them alive. This, I don't know. I mean, many people say that you need a, you know, long active TCR stimulation in order to survive somewhere, or they, you know, feed on short chain fatty acids. But why they survive this, uh, this I think it's unknown. Uh, there is no granulocyte signature in your RNA-seq data. Can you explain why and what else is missing in terms of the cellular components? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, um, uh, that's a very important question because, of course, any isolation method, be it biopsies or suction blisters, is a bias because you're not going to get all cells out. So isolating granulocytes is a problem. They just fall apart, they crumble, and we don't see them. So these cells are entirely missing, and we absolutely cannot say anything about them. That's a very important point. Also, mast cells are a little difficult. You get them out, but usually they are in a bad quality. But um, of course, like with PBMCs, you trash them all together, right? So yes, there are certain cell populations. You get a lot of cells out, but not all of them out. And also, like late differentiating keratinocytes, sort of their natural fate is to go into apoptosis. So of course, you're also not going to get them because the mRNA content is very low. Also for granulocytes, if the mRNA content is too low, they're going to be, you know, deleted with quality control and you're not going to see them. Last question and very brief because we are behind. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, consider a lecture about nodularis. We know dupilumide works for nodularis, But you look at the uh, cellular profile, uh, dupilumide is mainly IL-4, uh, 13, but the cellular profile for nodularis is quite different. All right? In atopic dermatitis, more IL-4 and 13. In uh, parigone nodularis, you know, the, the it's IL is a little bit different from atopic dermatitis. How does it work? No, I, there's, still, there's still type 2 signature there. There's IL-13 especially, not so much IL-4. But uh, I want, just wanted to say that the order of magnitude in atopic dermatitis seems to be much higher. But it's still there. Yeah. Thank you so much again, Patrick, for this really wonderful presentation. And... 
So it's my complete honor to introduce Michel Gilliet, that is one of the most known uh, dermatologists and immunologists um, uh, worldwide. He served on many, many um, uh, boards as president of the SDR um, um, on the board of EADV. Um, he is a very known physician scientist, and um, those of us working in the field of allergy uh, know his contribution. Uh, he was uh, intimately involved in the discovery of TSLP for those of you that uh, do not know that. Uh, so he had really amazing contributions to the field of uh, allergy. He published multiple publications and he works on both inflammatory skin diseases but also on uh, melanoma. And I'm really pleased that he is um, he's speaking here today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Emma, uh, for this very kind introduction. Uh, so Today, and thank you for the invitation, today I will be talking about um, a, a profiling approach that we are using in the clinics in Lausanne and uh, that we are using for all our patients with inflammatory disease and that has be, uh, becoming um, a, a part of our clinical routine. If the approach is less sophisticated for, uh, compared to what you just heard by Patrick, but I think I hope to convince you that it has really uh, clinical implications, clinical importance. So I can be very brief on this slide. Translation revolution in dermatology, this is the theme of uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, you know that we have increasing numbers of targeted therapy for inflammatory disease which are being developed and enter our clinical practice thanks uh, through the knowledge we acquired on immune pathways, we have adaptive immune pathways such as TH1, TH2, TH17, which have been discovered in the, in the uh, past decades. We have innate uh, pathways such as the one driven by type 1 interferons, the one driven by inflammasome with the production of IL-1 cytokines. Uh, why are they important in the skin? Because we have model diseases that are directly related to this immune pathway. You know, psoriasis is a TH17 disease, eczema, topic eczema is a TH2 disease. Lichen plano is a model for a TH1 disease, so the lichenoid reaction, which we also have in other diseases. Lupus is driven by type 1 interferons, and then we have neutrophilic disease, which are related to L1 cytokines, such as L1 beta, L1 alpha, and L36. Uh, here, just a list of uh, the molecules available in the clinics to target these pathways. For TH17, we have anti L23 or blockers of L17, A and F. For TH2, you know, uh, the uh, anti-L4 receptor or the anti-L13. Uh, TH1, we have, we have the JAK1-2 inhibitors for, for the IL-1. IL-36, we have now uh, uh, IL uh, anti-IL-36 receptor or we have the uh, anti-IL-1 receptor. And for type 1 interferons, we have uh, now an antibody against the interferon alpha receptor or uh, ducravacitinib, which is a TIC2 inhibitor. So you, we know that the, all these targeted therapies, they are quite efficient uh, for, these, uh, for these diseases, but we are all, always confronted with non-responders. And the key question here is, are we having actually the right uh, diagnosis? Are we targeting the right pathway? Are there maybe even immune shifts or paradoxical reactions uh, in the context of these uh, treatments? So, so to do that, to answer this question, so we started profiling our molecules and our approach was based on the nanostring technology which uh, recognizes the, the RNA uh, expression by, by a probe by probe hybridization. And what we thought is we wanted to compare this model disease that we, we un, where we understand the, the, uh, somehow the, uh, the pathogenic pathway one to the other. So we used chronic plaque survivor, topic dermatitis lichen planus, so TH17, TH2, TH1 diseases. Uh, we have lupus erythematosus, which is interferon-driven disease, neutrophilic diseases. Um, such as uh, sweet syndrome, uh, pyoderma gangrenosum, and or dissecant cellulitis. Then we also added an eosinophilic disease, which is the OL syndrome. So we analyzed transcriptomics of these diseases uh, and compared them one to, to the other to identify key Im Im immune uh, pathways. So basically we did the differential uh, expression uh, um, profiling. So these are the genes uh, listed here. They are very small. You don't have to 
uh, <coughs> look at them in all, all, all the details, but we compare the expression of psoriasis compared to all the other diseases which are, as, as you know, not related to TH17. So uh, what we came up is with the list of genes, and if you look at them, they are uh, related to TH17. They have chemokines that recruit TH17. Uh, we have the IL-17 uh, cytokines themselves, and we have downstream genes also on keratinocytes, which are induced by IL-17. When we do this for atopic dermatitis, we come up with a more restricted list of genes. They are all chemokines related to the TH2 pathway. For CLE, not surprisingly, these are interferon-induced uh, genes, so ISGs, typon interferon-related. Uh, for lichen planus, we have, uh, we have a list of genes which are related to, to the TH1 pathway for neutrophilic disease. These are myeloid genes, and for the Wells disease, we have a number of eosinophilic uh, uh, genes. So we use these genes to um, uh, plot them on a, on, a, on a heat map. You see that uh, on the, on, uh, um, um, uh, vertically are, are the genes of the different pathways. Horizontally you see all the diseases. So we have like 20 psoriasis, 20 atopic dermatitis, 15 CLE, uh, 10 uh, lichen planus, some wells, some neutrophilic diseases. And we plot them according to to this list of genes, and you see a very nice clustering of the disease, unbiased clustering of the disease uh, by, by the disease, so all the psoriasis, they cluster together. And why do they cluster together? Based on this very unique uh, expression of our gene signature, so the TH17 signature for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, they cluster because of the TH2 disease, the TH2 signature, we call it the TH2 model. CLE classes because of type 1 interferon model, LP because of TH1 model, eosinophils, so wells because of the eosinophilic model, and neutrophils because of the myelin model. So very nice. You see also, if you look, for example, at the atopic dermatitis, you see some expression of TH in, in a subset of patients of, of, of the TH17 model. You see, yeah, you see it up there. Can I can point on it? I'm not sure. Doesn't really work. Yeah, here. You see a, a subset that has some more TH, TH1, but the dominant pathway is the TH2. So, what was interesting is that if you look at the clustering uh, um, of these per disease, we saw that these immune model genes they were uh, much more uh, better perform, uh, performing than if you use the entire list of genes. So, these are 600 immune genes uh, shown here. So, we have this. Uh, Fouts mallow index, which is a combination of precision and, and sensibility. And you see there it's much closer to one, so 0 0.95, than if you use all the genes, or also if you use medical markers uh, identified by, uh, by NS4, which is only 0 A2, which indicates that these immune model genes, they may be high, uh, of highly diagnostic uh, relevance. Another way we can look at that is that if you plot all these immune models, on a spider plot, and you see that uh, the, the older psoriatic sample, they point towards the TH17, so having the highest dominant pathways to TH17, AD points towards TH2, uh, lichen plants to TH1. I'm showing you that because this is what we use in the clinic, so our residents, they, they look at the heat map, but they also want to look at these, these spider plots really to uh, identify which, which are the pathways that, that are uh, dominant. CLE, type 1 interference, well, is eosinophilic and neutrophils. Uh, neutrophilic diseases are more uh, towards neutrophils. So, now, what, what about other diseases? So, I, I listed you model disease which has, have a dominant uh, pathways where we identify this, uh, this, this pathway. So, let's look, for example, at bolus pemphigoid. We did a lot of disease, but I'm just showing you two of them. Bolus pemphigoid. So, what are the, uh, the, the, the pathways which are highlighted? So, we did differential expression. We could not see any additional uh, a pathway, an additional model that, that came up. But what was interesting is that also they all clustered uh, together when we used this, this immune model list. And what came up is that they have, not surprisingly, they have a, a TH2 pathway, comes up the eosinophils, not surprisingly, and they have a macrophage uh, a signature, signature here. And this is shown also in the, uh, in the, in the, 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 the spider plot on the side. Uh, we also did, for example, drug eruption, and there, interestingly, also no in new immune model, but we see a different combination of immune models. So we have type 1 interference, they all cluster together. We have type 1 interference, we have macrophage, we have uh, eosinophils. So we think these <coughs> immune models are highly 
diagnostic for a lot of, uh, of inflammatory disease and we could use that in the clinic. And now, so that was the question, can this molecular profile used for diagnosis of und undetermined cases? And we'll just, just like uh, to, to show you uh, a number of, 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 uh, of clinical cases. So this is an erythroderma. Uh, of a six, uh, 86 year old male patient. He came into the clinic with the third episode of erythroderma, previously diagnosed as, as uh, drug reaction. It was thought that the patient took uh, phytotherapy, so uh, we thought it was a, dr a drug erythroderma. As a lot of times, histology is not very contributive to the diag diagnosis, and you can see it here. So you, you see some spongiosis, but you saw, see also the interface dermatitis. So I mean, is that a drug eruption? Is that an eczema? We don't know. So what we did is we profiled it and we clustered it to our, to our reference of, of, of key uh, model diseases. And we saw that this patient uh, clearly clustered within the atopic dermatitis uh, patients shown, uh, show, shown here with a clearly dominant TH2 uh, profile. So we diagnosed it uh, AD erythroderma. We treated it with, uh, with Dupixent. And uh, after uh, a few injections, just after one month, he had a complete clearance of, of his uh, erythroderma. So this is one, one of the examples. So, so we think erythroderma, we could use that because a lot of times at initial presentation, if the patient has no history of the, of, of the underlying disease, prior history of the underlying disease, it is difficult to, to diagnose. And what we uh, uh, did here is so 15 uh, erythroderma, we all, we all immune profiled them, and we see that uh, five of them, they cluster within the, the DH17 psoriasis. We have eight of them in the atopic dermatitis, and two of them uh, here, they have a TH1, they have, they have type 1 interference, they have some macrophage signature, so they cluster with the, with the drug, drug eruptions. So what we then did, we looked at the, uh, at the final diagnosis of erythroderma. A lot of time is, is done months after the initial episode, and it's based on the long-term evolution of the, of the erythroderma, the treatment response, and uh, the drug testing. And so we compared the initial clinical histology and the molecular diagnosis with molecular risk unequivocal. There is there's only one uh, one, one uh, key clustering. And what we found is that while the clinical we were we always had differential diagnosis, so we were not very sure. So the, the value was 61%, the predictive value. Histology was, was better, but also was not complete, 85%. All our 15 patients had uh, um, at least 100% 100 uh, uh, you know, matching with what the diagnosis was after, after months after, um, um, after uh, after initial diagnosis. So we think the performance is very good of this, uh, of this molecular profiling. Can we use the molecular profiling to guide our treatment choice? So, so here we have a psoriasis, non-responsive TH17 blockade, 63-year-old uh, uh, male patient, um, known for psoriasis since 2017, no atopy. He had this resistant psoriasis, failure of methotrex, safe fumaric acid, apremilast, anti-L17, anti-L23. Here are the images. So we have some, some lesions which are well demarked. Uh, palm, uh, palmer also on the, on the forearm. I mean, that this could be a psoriasis. Also histology, very psoriasis form. It has some, a little bit of, of, of spongiosis, but it's, it's very psoriasis form. So we cannot really make a, a, a diagnosis. So we, we, we did again the profiling. It falls again, um, unbiased clustering within the TH2, within the atopic dermatitis with a clear uh, pointing towards the TH2 uh, profile, so which indicated that this, this was, was, was uh, an eczema, TH2, and again, what did we do? We treated him with, uh, with only the loading dose of Dupixent and, and the patient cleared completely. Uh, so again, indicating that uh, um, this, we could use these, these modules and this profiling to uh, match our, our treatment response. Another, uh, um, uh, another case, this is 77-year-old male, adult onset atopic dermatitis, histology confirmed, but after uh, initiation of Dupix anti flares after, after three injections uh, with anti-L4, uh, anti so Dupixent receptor. So we were uh, fortunate to have also the baseline bi uh, biopsy in this one, so we performed again the, the clustering. What we found is that the, the initial um, initially, uh, it, it has a TH2, so it was the right choice to, to 
used to be sent. But what we found is that after these three, uh, three, uh, three weeks and, and uh, the, the, non the non response or the, the flare up, uh, he had the emergence of a TH1. Um, of a TH1 pathway, while there was a reduction of the of the TH2 uh, pathway, and in, in the meantime, we have five of these patients, so where we have a, a pre-profile and a post-profile, and these are are, are, are are matched. So you see, they all have a, a dominant blue, which is the TH2 pathway prior to the start of Dupixent, but then they relapse within uh, uh, or or they, they they flare up within the within the months or the two months. And the biopsy shows uh, uh, really a dominance of the of the uh, of the th an emergence of the th1 uh, pathway. So how, how how can you treat these patients? So the patients that I show you, uh, I, I don't have to go into details with that. I'm sure you all know. So we can target the th1 pathway with uh, uh, um, Jack Jack12 uh, inhibitors. You see you 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 see it here. And so these patients was uh, treated with with uh, Olumiant Jack12 uh, inhibitor um, for four weeks, and we have complete clearance of of his uh, topic dermatitis flare-up. So based on that, we did a, uh, a larger uh, study. So here we have uh, patients, AD, but also psoriasis, also bullous uh, 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 pemphigoid, and some lichen, which we put on their, uh, on their uh, treatment, on their targeted treatment. And we looked whether the pre-treatment biopsy, so before we put them on, on, the, on, on, on the targeted treatment, was matching with the treatment. So definition of MAT, TH2 is with, uh, with uh, anti-L4 receptor. Uh, the, uh, the other definition of MAT for psoriasis is a dominant, apologize, a dominant TH17, uh, where it was treated with anti-L17 or anti-L23, and the dominant TH1 should be matched with the JAK1-2 inhibitor. So what we found, if the biopsy was matched with the, uh, um, with the treatment, we had 84% chance that uh, the patient responded, while 16% were non-responders, probably to other, uh, uh, to other reasons, not, not, not due to the matching. But what is important is that all our patients that were uh, mismatched, they did not respond. So 100% so of, the, of the mismatched uh, uh, patients Pre, uh, um, pre starting this, uh, the, the targeted therapy uh, were non matched. What about the post treatment bi biopsy? So, so, we also biopsied uh, patients that did not respond. And what was interesting here is that all of our patients we biopsied uh, that did not respond to targeted therapy were actually non, -resp uh, non responders. Here we have 10 patients. And of the 10 patients, we rematched based on the profile, we rematched the, the, the patients and, and their therapy, and they all responded back to th therapy. And this brings me to the conclusion slide. So I think this molecular profiling that we are proposing provides a powerful diagnostic support for inflammatory skin disease. It allows unequivocal classification of undetermined cases. I have not shown you, but we have a number of undetermined cases that we can classify, and also the erythroderma cases. It can predict the chance to respond to targeted therapy through model matching, and it can uh, provide therapeutic guidance for management of non-responders, and I haven't shown you that also for paradoxical uh, reaction. And with that, I come to the conclusion. Thank you for your attention. So, thank you. Thank you so much for this truly brilliant lecture. Due to the fact that we are uh, behind and I want you guys to enjoy uh, the break and you can ask questions during the break, but I want to, to move on if it's okay. Yeah, but truly amazing lecture. So it is my uh, pleasure to introduce um, uh, Muslifa Hanifa um, that I've known for quite some time. Um, she is perhaps uh, the first one that introduced a, the a human cell atlas into dermatology and has done amazing work in this field. She is both a dermatologist and immunologist. And um, um, we are really fortunate to really hear from the best in the field um, about the human cell atlas and the adaptation to dermatology. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, Emma, for the um, introduction and the invitation, and it's a huge pleasure to be here. I think I f came to the first inflammatory meeting, and yes. I was astonished <laughs> by the ceiling. 
uh, and it's fantastic to be here again. Um, my slides are not coming on. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the human cell atlas, and really what I want to tell you is the kind of work that's ongoing. Um, it's very much uh, fits with the theme of technologies and how technologies is going to make massive differences. Uh, and as soon as my slides come on, yeah, brilliant, thank you. So about 20 years ago now, uh, one of the transformative technology that arose at that time was DNA sequencing, and this was then used to uh, profile the human genome and led to the Human Genome Project and gave us basically the book of life. Um, and you know, you had the healthy genome, and then as more and more individuals were sequenced, then you can find variants that actually gave rise to diseases. But we have the one genome uh, which encodes for all the cells in our human body, including the complex organs such as skin with multiple cell types. So there are about 37 trillion cells. And this incredible diversity is encoded by that one genome. Uh, and how it does that is by regulating differential gene expression. Uh, gives rise to the different cell types, the, which gives the identity of the cells, the different programs, and, and functional consequences thereof. So this comes to the next technological um, revolution in terms of resolution revolution, which is being able to kind of uh, measure individual cells and profiling them for their gene expression uh, and other parameters. So what you can now do is actually take a piece of tissue, dissociate the cells, measure the RNA of those cells, but also, although early technologies was very much focused on sequencing RNA, now you can actually use um, multiple modalities, combinatorial, in fact, in some cases, such as protein and RNA, or open chromatin for the epigenome, as well as T cell receptors and B cell receptors. But that really requires you to take tissue and dissociate cells. Uh, and there's been advances in terms of spatial technologies where you can now profile in situ, uh, not just gene expression, but also increasingly protein uh, at single cell or near single cell resolution. Um, and there are really kind of two platforms. Uh, one really gives you single cell uh, level measurements, but often this is limited parameters. Uh, and then the other platform, which gives you near single cell resolution, a small capture area, uh, and then you can profile whole transcriptome. There are technologies that whole, go whole transcriptome and sub single cell level, but the analysis is actually quite difficult because it's quite hard to make out where, where the cell boundaries are. Um, and, and this gives you two parallel types of data sets, the suspension data sets and the spatial data sets. Uh, and often that can be seen as two different entities. And there are more computational algorithms that now allow you to integrate those data sets so that you can actually uh, are better inform and link spatial uh, and suspension types uh, uh, information. So either by transferring annotation from the single cell to the across single cell, and then you can impute the rest of the spatial information that you haven't measured, or in where you don't have single cell, you can then almost do like a bulk deconvolution analysis of the small capture area and ask what cells there are based on the single cell uh, RNA sequencing data. So this is really the transformative technologies that has enabled the Human Cell Atlas, which is an ongoing global initiative. And the idea here is going to give you the book of cells. Uh, and this is worldwide, uh, lots, many countries uh, and many researchers uh, globally, anyone can join. Uh, you can just go to that website uh, and join HCA and find out what's happening. So why do we want a reference atlas? I gave you the example of the human genome, which allows you to map variants, uh, disease-causing variants, and understand why we have um, predisposition to diseases. Uh, but the reference uh, atlas, in terms of the book of cells, will allow us to now use it as a guidebook and a blueprint, as a guidebook to better understand disease uh, st cell states and molecular function to guide cell engineering. So if you know what the in vivo cell is like, how do you make something that is most faithfully resembling this uh, in vivo cell, or in fact, uh, artificially generate cells. 
Um, and a lot of that technology is currently underway in forms of organoid, um, either from inducible pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells. But how close are they to the in vivo cells and what can we learn from having a reference atlas? So I'll give an example of how we've used it as a guidebook to map human disease. And for the last few years, we've been mapping the blood and immune cells in the, hum the developing human immune system. So these are uh, organs from uh, human embryos and fetuses. And what we've then been able to do that is to then ask in the setting of disease, so for example, childhood leukemia, how it compares with the healthy reference atlas. So here's an example of where we've taken uh, bulk RNA sequencing of uh, infant leukemia, and then basically deconvolute it and ask how they resemble to these the healthy cells and then see what is the kind of like predominant signature of the leukemia. And you can see how it shows the vast majority of infant leukemias are indeed B cells, but there is a small population of patients where the disease is uh, prognostically poor and fatal, where the signature is not of a B cell, but actually of an early lymphoid progenitor. So this is just an example of how that can be done. And I just spoke in the other session about how we can use the skin, adult skin reference atlas to understand cutaneous T cell lymphoma. But do we really have a good skin uh, reference atlas? Um, and, and that's kind of what I'm going to highlight now. What we have is a large number of human adult skin single cell RNA sequencing data, more than 40 published uh, studies so far. Uh, and what we're currently trying to do, and this is together with the Human Cell Atlas Skin Bio Network, uh, led by Maria Kasper, Max Plikus, and also Fiona Watt, is to try and assemble all of these data sets, a roadmap of what this will look like and what steps it will involve uh, was highlighted in JID um, recently. But I now want to show you how we can now use that reference atlas uh, and compare it against disease, and particularly work that I'm uh, undertaking as part of uh, uh, an open target study uh, piggybacking on the uh, platform trial for atopic dermatitis called Beacon, uh, and which is led by Catherine Smith at King's College London. Um, and essentially, these are where patients are given dupilumab, JAK1 inhibitor, and methotrexate, uh, and then they are profiled before and serially after treatment. And as part of this open target study, which is a, a consortium involving Sanger, Ambul EBI, and multiple pharma partners, uh, what we will be doing is taking biopsies from patients, and this is about 150 patients, uh, and doing longitudinal profile, uh, single cell multi-omic, also visium, matched uh, peripheral blood, uh, and also genotyping, which will allow us to understand the molecular and the cellular features of the disease, how it resolves, which are the responders, which are the non-responders, uh, and um, you know, expression quantitative trait loci analysis, the EQTL analysis, uh, really building a model of whether or not we can start to predict very early on who should get what treatment and who will benefit from what treatment. And this will also include validation with um, Xenium uh, and also uh, CRISPR perturbation. So ultimately, I think what I like to kind of uh, bring across is the idea that with these types of studies, not just the ones that we're involved in, but globally, we can start to put the data together and using um, AI, start to build generative models and foundation models, which will be an incredible opportunity to sort of really get to understand uh, skin diseases and uh, you know, begin to sort of like predict and, and uh, uh, drive forward precision medicine. So that's adult skin, but do we have a skin cell atlas across the li human life lifespan? Do we have data for prenatal skin and pediatric skin? Um, I'm going to talk about prenatal skin cell atlas tomorrow. Uh, I think it's in the afternoon, if you're interested. Um, but I'm just going to highlight a little bit about some of the work on the pediatric skin cell atlas, which is something that uh, is a, a large consortium of uh, researchers from Sanger, QMUL, Newcastle, and also uh, New York, um, Stockholm, uh, funded by the Chan Zuckerberg um, Initiative. And here we will be sampling uh, pediatric uh, infant and pediatric skin across multiple sites. Uh, across a diverse range of ancestry using multimodal platform uh, and also multi-scale analysis uh, and to fill in the pediatric component of this atlas to complement the prenatal and the adult. Uh, and this will be very exciting um, as we go. And I want to finish off by saying, 
it's all well and good creating reference atlases, but how is everybody going to benefit from having a reference atlas? And how do we unlock the data so that it can empower a broader group of users? Uh, and one way I think this will be driven forwards is with research software engineering. Uh, we have data generation, we have bioinformatics computation, but how do we make it such that it's a bit like using an app on your smartphone rather than needing compute infrastructure and being able to code? So um, all of the single cell uh, or data from our lab so far is actually available through a web portal where you can actually click uh, and then actually download the data or browse uh, through the web portal. But as we advance with spatial analysis, what I think would be very, oh, that video did not play and it's, okay, yeah, now it's playing. So this is where we've allowed the integration of suspension data, in situ sequencing and BZM, and you can query across the modalities. So this gene is now being shown across all three modalities. So that's a human lower limb. But what we're building is that this will be a skin section and you can now see where the cells are, where the genes are, uh, and you can see the environment. And this will be you know, shown not just for healthy skin, but also diseased skin. And you can then zoom in and zoom out in the way that Google Map uh, allows you to sort of like zoom in and zoom out when you're actually in a city and trying to work out where you are. And you can look at you know, individual RNA molecules um, and so on and so forth. So this is really exciting. Um, this is a pipeline. Uh, and I'm going to finish there and thank my lab uh, for the fantastic years of research. Uh, and um, the many collaborators, funders, um, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this groundbreaking uh, work. We have time for one question only, so. Okay, thank you so much. Keep your questions for the break. And I'm really excited to introduce Dan Kaplan that is known to all of us. He's a professor in the Department of Dermatology at the University of Pittsburgh, and he is very involved in, in, in the studies of the skin immunity and how different uh, immune cells interact with each other and with other cells, including neurons. Uh, lately, he also has done a really groundbreaking work in, in understanding the neuron um, immunology of the skin, and he'll talk to us today about genetically targeted mice to explore each and inflammation. Thanks Thank very much, and thanks, Emma and Kenji, for the invitation. And I realize now I think I have misunderstood the mission. There is no RNA-seq. There is no big data. I do not have one heat map <laughs> or UMAP to show you today. What I want to sort of like start off is I want to talk broadly about uh, nerves in the skin and how they control inflammation. Um, and then at the same time, talk about some of the techniques that we use, but all of this leading up to a new story that I'm going to touch on, but dive into more tomorrow. So if you want to think about host defense um, and how the, the nervous system is involved in this, like one example is pain, right? And there's this concept of uh, behavioral immunity. If you have pain, that alerts you to there is trauma, there's something for you to take care of, and you'll also withdraw your limb and you actually form an aversive memory to whatever you did that caused the pain, don't do that again. There's an internal version of this as well. For instance, if you uh, eat poisons, pollutants, or infections, there are these um, automatic responses that our body has that has a specific function of eliminating the toxin and you also form um, a strong memory to avoid doing that again. But then there's the third one, which is itch, right? So everyone has itch. Itch is um, obviously one of the cardinal symptoms of atopic dermatitis and a variety of other dermatological diseases. You get it in response to um, intrinsic disease, but also um, parasite infection, arthropod. But what's the benefit of itch, right? No, number one, itching, it, it feels awesome, right? So everyone likes to scratch an itch. So it's not aversive, right? It's actually pleasurable and reinforced. Um, but at the same time, you know, what is the point? To, to remove the parasite? It's, it's unclear, and that's kind of what I want to touch on by the end. Okay, so what do we know about the importance of the uh, sensory nervous system in the skin and its relationship to disease? Well, here is a great series of uh, anecdotal cases by Ethan Lerner, where uh, there are these examples of patients with atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, allergic contact dermatitis, and these patients had had uh, nerve ligation for various um, reasons, and it was noted that the disease resolved 
in the limb downstream of the, the nerve damage. There are also examples of intradermal injection of botulinum toxin, which prevents release of neurotransmitters locally in the skin, and that leads to improvement of psoriatic lesions. And there's a more recent paper where lidocaine was introduced intrathecally in patients with psoriasis, and the psoriatic disease um, improved in the dermatome that was injected. Now, a lot of this, um, we know from mouse studies, comes from inhibition of that pain-sensing pathway. And here's a whole pile of paper that were all done in mice. Some of these are ours. Many of these are by much better labs, showing that if you inhibit these pain-sensing neurons, which are often identified by this um, ion channel TRIP-V1, that you can improve or, or modulate the disease. Okay, so. One of the challenges of dealing with sensory neurons in the skin is that there are many, 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 many different types of them. Um, neuroscientists, I think, would argue that each neuron is unique and needs to be looked at individually. As an immunologist, I really like to think of things in terms of subsets. And so I think the field is kind of settled on within the sensory unmyelinated neurons in the skin, sensory neurons in the skin, you can break them down basically into four imperfect groups. So group number one are the peptidergic. These I express TRIP-V1. These sense heat and pain, release some well-known um, uh, neuropeptides. And like I showed you before, they're necessary and sufficient to trigger inflammation in the skin. We actually showed that they were sufficient. You just activate the neurons and you'll get inflammation. There's another subset which is less well-studied called the non-peptidergic one. These neurons release glutamate and actually suppress mast cell function tonically and in response to perturbations. But what I want to talk about today is one of these two, of the last two categories. This is non-peptidergic 2 and non-peptidergic 3. Non-peptidergic 2 express this terribly named protein called MRGPRA3. Um, this is actually a receptor for chloroquine. And these two neurons uh, mediate itch responsiveness. This second one here, the NP3, uh, these are the guys that express the IL-31 receptor, um, which uh, is important in um, uh, nemalunzumab uh, treatments. Anyhow, so with these NP2, what do we know about them? Well, we know they transduce itch sensation. They terminate in the epidermis, actually fairly high up in the epidermis. They express receptors for histamine and uh, PAR1, which is a protease sensor, and they're activated by chloroquine. So I was asked to review some of the techniques that, that are often used in these sorts of studies. And you can make um, a big list. I've broken them down into uh, requirement versus sufficiency. And if you're looking at requirement, you can simply cut the nerves with a, a forceps or scissors. You can inject a small toxin like resinifera toxin. This will actually ablate all neurons that express TRIP-V1. Um, you can also use a genetic means, like using pre-mediated expression of the primate diphtheria toxin receptor. The, obviously, we're all talking in mice here, just to make that clear, right? Just, so you can then inject the diphtheria toxin, and all of the neurons expressing the diphtheria toxin receptor will be ablated. You can inject uh, Botox into the skin, and there's some small molecule inhibitors of individual neuropeptides. In terms of sufficiency, you can actually electrically stimulate the nerves. You can insert probes directly into the neuron to activate them. Uh, you could administer neuropeptides or other activating molecules, either into the neuron, the DRG, or into the skin. Um, you can use optogenetic activation, which is a genetic way to activate the neurons. We'll talk about that more. And you can use these designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs, or DREDs, um, which actually are, are discussed. We're going to talk about them at the end. OK, so let's start with optogenetics. How does this work? It's a, a marvelously clever technique. Basically, there's this protein called channel rhodopsin 2. This is an ion channel. It's normally closed. When it is exposed to blue light, usually you use laser light, blue light, it will cause the channel to open and allow ions to flux through. If you genetically express this channel rhodopsin protein on your neuron subset of interest, you can then take the mice, expose them to blue laser light, and now you are able to activate the neurons exactly where the laser hits, exactly at the moment when the laser hits, and yet there's no other perturbation to the skin, there's no heat or nothing else. And so you can specifically ask, what is the effect of triggering activation of these neurons synchronously at this location? And so, these mice, we call them TRIP-V1-AI32, so we express the channel rhodopsin 
which is the AI32 under TRIP31. Um, the experiments are really simple. There's mice, we put them to sleep, and then we shine the laser on the skin and we ask what happens. And here's just an example of what happens after a couple days of lasering. You can see on the left, this is a normal mouse here, and on the right, you can see there's a colossal inflammation that has sprung up, and it's largely a psoriasiform type inflammation with a neutrophil and lymphocytic infiltrate with perikeratosis. Um, however, this doesn't work with all neurons. So here's an example of another CRE. These are the MRGPRA3 that I was just talking to you about a minute ago. And you can see that if you activate these neurons, pretty much nothing happens. You see it looks exactly the same. And so by triggering the neurons that sense pain, that's sufficient to trigger inflammation. So anything that causes pain, you can argue is immunological danger and causes inflammation in the skin. A neuron subset here, these A3s that cause itch, are obviously quite different. They're not sufficient to cause inflammation in the skin. Something else is going on. So now we've moved on to, I want to move on to the loss of function model. So this is the same MRGPRA3 with a diphtheria toxin receptor expressed in those neurons. We inject diphtheria toxin and then we can count the number of neurons and you can see after DT the number of neurons goes down. Just to prove to you that it works, if we, in the red circles, we're injecting chloroquine and we're seeing how itchy are these mice over 30 minutes and you can see the mice without the neurons are a lot less itchy. But if we do the same thing and we inject IL-31, this targets the other NP3 subset of neurons, you can see everything is fine. Okay, so functionally, what does this matter? So we decided to look at two types of allergic contact dermatitis that were known to involve Th2 type cells and involve IgE. And so if you look at Fitzy here on the left, you can see that mice without the A3 neurons don't develop the contact dermatitis. This is ear swelling right here. And if you do it with oxazolone, you also have a defect as well. But in a Th1, Th17 model, there's no difference whatsoever. So there's something special about those two types of dermatitis. If we look at scratching, it was actually very revealing. Mice that are lacking the MRGP or A3 neurons, they scratch much less in response to Fitchy CHS and much, much less in response to Oxazolone CHS. But with DNFB, there's no difference whatsoever. And this led us to think that scratching might have something to do with why there was inflammation in the skin. Um, and so then just to prove this, we did the same experiment now. This is looking at ear thickness, and we compare all these mice here are treated with Fitzy. We compare wild-type mice. Mice that don't scratch because they're missing those MRGP or A3 neurons. And the last group are mice that can't scratch because they're wild-type mice, but they have those Elizabethan collars, cones of shame, so they can't scratch their ears. And you can see in the Fitzy dermatitis model, if the mice don't or can't scratch, you don't get the inflammation. With oxazolone, you see a, a decrease, and with DNFB, it doesn't really matter whatsoever. It's through a different mechanism. And now, because this is a short talk, I'm skipping over like 20 slides, and so we're just gonna have a logical leap of how all this works, and you're gonna take my word for it that activation of mast cells is the key ingredient in this mechanism. Okay, and so I want to now move away from CHS and I just want to look at mast cell function in vivo. And this really surprised me that this worked. And the way the assay works is you inject um, a mouse with IgE that is specific for a haptin, DNP, and then you swing back a little bit later and you just inject the haptin into the skin. And what that does is it causes all the mast cells to cross-link the FC epsilon on their surface and you end up with a synchronized mast cell degranulation through the IgE receptor, the FC epsilon receptor. This is a very standard model in, in the mast cell field and it's called the primary cutaneous anaphylaxis model. So if you do that, and here, we're just looking at scratching now. So you can see, you, this is, you cross-link the FC epsilon receptor at time zero, and you see, look, you get scratching, which is quick, it decays quickly, and the mice that don't have the MRGP or A3 neurons, much less scratching, okay? If you look at ear thickness, you see something that's also well-recognized, that you see this immediate edema in the ear. The ears get thick, 
and then it slowly goes away, but here at 10 hours, there's um, ear thickness that is secondary to an infiltrate. It's a neutrophilic infiltrate. It's actually a TNF defendant, neutrophil infiltrate. And you see that in the regular mice, when you activate the mast cells, you get this, this infiltrate. But if there's no scratching, mice that don't scratch or can't scratch, you don't have this infiltrate that comes into the ears, and you can actually measure the edema and see that that's the way this works. Okay, so now we're left with the question of how does scratching augment this FC epsilon mediated inflammation? So we thought of a lot of possibilities. We thought of TSLP, but that was our number one choice. It's not TSLP, we thought of IL-33, no, that's not it. We thought of IL-25, no, that's not it. And we went through a long list, and then um, finally we thought, well, maybe, maybe it's substance P, okay? So, substance P is a well-known neuropeptide released from the pain-sensing neurons that triggers mast cell activation. And so we injected this small molecule called QWF, this blocks all of the substance P receptors, right? MRGPRB2 is on mast cells, but also the neurokinin 1 receptor on other cell types, and there, there are many other ligands for it. And I want to point out here that if we do the same PCA, this is just activating mast cells in vivo, and you just block substance P, you get less edema, you get less TNF, you get less ear thickness too that I forgot to show you here, but it doesn't affect the scratching. So the release of substance P is downstream of the scratching. Now, there are lots of sources of things that can activate substance P receptors. So we really had to prove that it was coming out of the neurons. And to do that, I want to introduce the last technique, and that is the designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. It's a cool model. This is a standard everyday model that people use in neuroscience. Basically, you um, express either a gain of function G protein receptor or a loss of function G protein receptor that have been modified to respond to this um, synthetic molecule called CNO. So uh, there are all kinds of tools for these, so you can just breed them in. And what we basically did is we took our same trip V1 Cre and we bred it to mice where we could inhibit the TRPV1 neurons when we give CNO. And the beauty of this is you can inhibit the neurons exactly when you give the drug. And just to show you, this is um, the, the TRPV1 silencing, it's called HM4DI DREAD, to silence TRPV1 neurons. We give the CNO at time zero, and then we put the mouse paws on a hot plate, warm plate, warm plate. And then the mice will pull their foot away when they detect the heat. And if the neurons are inhibited, it takes them a long time to pull their foot away. And so you can see this is um, a comparison off of baseline, and you can see when you give the drug, the mice take a long time to pull their foot away, and it lasts about seven hours. And you can do this um, again every 12 hours or so. The postdoc loved this experiment. And you can see it doesn't desensitize over time. It keeps on working. And just to show you functionally that this matters, this is just an experiment using amiquimod. Um, it's been widely published that these TRPV1 neurons are required for the amiquimod response, and if we silence the neurons using the CNO, you can see the response to amiquimod is blunted. So everything is working exactly as you would expect. So now if we go back to our in vivo mast cell activation model, and now we just turn off the pain sensing neurons, you can see that when you activate the mast cells, now they don't work very well. You get less TNF, but the scratching is not impacted. So we're able to decouple the scratching from the inflammation in the skin. And so I've skipped over lots of bits, so I can, there's some parts that might not be fully fleshed out, so let me just bring it all together in this model and encourage you to see my talk Friday, where I go into this in more detail. Okay, so for a haptin here, haptin here in green. One of the things that these um, haptins do is they bind to Ig on the surface of mast cells. This leads to mast cell degranulation, and when mast cells degranulate, a lot of itchy material is released. This then circles back on the MRGPRA3 neurons, leading to itch, but also leading to some TNF, and you get a little bit of inflammation. But remember, you need scratching for this to work. So how does the scratching work then? So the scratching now, so the itch triggers the scratching, 
and the scratching behavior activates these TRPV1 neurons to activate substance P. And in a, a little bit that I didn't show you, it turns out that it activate mast cells with substance P and the FC epsilon receptor, you get a synergistic mast cell response. So now you get much more TNF released and now you get a much greater amount of inflammation. And I think the significance of this is this is an example. So we want to show that activation of these TRPV1 uh, nociceptors and synergistic mast cell is an explanation for why scratching exacerbates um, allergic inflammation. So why is it that when you scratch a lesion of atopic dermatitis, it gets worse, right? Well, I would argue this is one of the reasons why. And we've done these same models with Staph aureus and we see the very same output as well. I just didn't have time to show you. And I'd go one step further, and now I'm going to speculate and say that one of the important functions of itch is to trigger scratching to actually trigger this pain, uh, activation of these pain-sensing neurons to trigger local inflammation. And I'm going to argue that that's important in the immune response against agents that have evolved not to cause pain, but rather to cause itch. And with that, head scratch and comment. I'll just thank all the people who did this work. This is all one guy's work. This is Andrew Liu's work. He's, a, um, he's an MD, PhD, MD, PhD in the lab, looking to match into Durham in the near future. And if anyone is still able to, I'd be happy to take any questions if we're allowed. Yeah, we have time for one question <laughs> so that we break uh, on time. Yeah. Where would you start? Would you go for the new, block the neuron, block the mast cell? So if you want to break the itch scratch cycle, we should do exactly what I tell all my patients. We put them in two arm casts, right? So there's no scratching possible. Um, How well, many patients uh, return? When yeah, no one, no one, that. no one has taken me up on that. Oddly, I don't, I don't, I don't quite understand. I, I think there are many places where you can stop that, right? So a lot of treatments that look at itch try to treat some of the factors released from mast cells right? Leukotrienes and histamines. And, you know, it's like sort of maybe kind of effective. And the challenge there is that the number of um, active proteins released from these mast cells and their granules, the list is like 300 things. So yes, histamine does cause itch, but so does somatostatin, and there's like 20 other things on there. So I would say either focusing on preventing the mast cell from degranulating in the first place, or preventing the synergy by blocking um, substance P upstream, I think would be better ways of doing it. Thank you. Thank you for this very amazing talk, and I managed to get you on time to the break, so there will be refreshments outside. And please be here. We will start exactly in 15 minutes.